Today, I want to talk about the average true range, in particular, how it's calculated, some historical context about it, and some nuances that are important to know if you want your calculations to be accurate and not accidentally fire off some incorrect trading signals. I learned this the hard way, and so in this video, I'm going to show you how you can avoid those mistakes. We'll start off with a rough idea of what the average true range actually is. It's just an attempt to measure volatility. So generally speaking, as the average true range goes up, it's measuring volatility. So that means that we're having larger and larger moves in a particular asset. Equally, if volatility goes down, the average true range also goes down. That's the point of it. It was built as a volatility indicator. And although in this particular example, it does follow the price quite closely, we can see here that, for example, the price tops here and the volatility continues increasing because we're seeing some big jumps. It was first published by Wells Wilder, John Wells Wilder, in his 1978 book, New Concepts in Technical Trading Systems. And if we scroll down to the appropriate page here, which I believe is page 21, we can see the definition for the true range. So before we have the average true range, we need the true range. It's calculated as the maximum of three possible numbers for each bar. So the first one here is our intraday range. So the difference between today's high and today's low. It's pretty easy to see that the larger that number, the more volatility that we're experiencing intraday. However, Wilder was trading during the 1970s when markets were only open at certain times and we could have huge gaps up overnight, especially in commodities. And therefore, it's also really important to consider intraday volatility. So volatility between two candles. And therefore, we also include the difference between yesterday's close and today's high, and also the difference between yesterday's close and today's low. These are slightly different to the normal candles that you might have seen, but this is the open, this is the high, the low, and the close. And so by doing that, we capture volatility when we have a situation like this. So we've had this huge gap up overnight to the next bar, and then there's been some kind of trading halt because of the crazy price action. Obviously, this should contribute to the volatility. It should increase the volatility in whatever indicator we're producing here. And that's what these two items account for. You could argue in the crypto markets, we don't particularly need it because it's 24 seven, but that's how the true range is defined. And it's still used in this format today. So we've got this number for each bar in our historical data we now need to smooth this out somehow. If you were to just plot this, it would be really spiky and all over the place. It just wouldn't be very useful. So we need some sort of smoothing. He calls it an average here. And the method that Wilder proposes is for your first data point, you pick some period or length. So the standard is 14. You take the last 14 values of the true range add them all up, divide by 14, so calculate their simple average. And then for every value after that initial value, you use this recursive formula here. So you take 13 multiplied by that value that you've just calculated, add onto that the current value of the true range for today. So you're taking yesterday's average true range, multiply it by 13, add on today's true range, divide the whole thing by 14. This is a recursive formula, and it's different to something like the simple moving average where we always consider the previous, say, 14 values or however long the time period is. In this case, once we've calculated the first value, we only need to understand the previous value of the average true range and today's true range. The reason he defined the formula like this is likely because he was doing these calculations with just a simple pocket calculator. He didn't have access to the charting tools that we have today. This is how he did his calculations and generated his trading signals, writing them down by hand. And it's much easier to just type in today's value of the true range, have a little program in your calculator that 
combines that with the previous value and spits out today's value of the average true range rather than having to type in that full list of the 14 values that came before it and worrying about keeping that all in memory a recursive formula was much easier for someone on the trading floor who needed quick calculations with a reasonable degree of accuracy he calls it the volatility index here but we know it as the average true range today and this general method of smoothing out data is often called wilder's smoothing method or maybe you might have seen it as the relative moving average or the rma so if we go back to trading view here you can see it's using the rma method for smoothing out the data we could change that to the sma or the ema etc etc but the original version uses the rma now why am i explaining all of this the main reason is that this method of smoothing creates small inaccuracies in the calculations of the average true range depending on where exactly you start calculating it and how many warm-up bars you use which probably wasn't a problem when you were drawing graphs on graph paper like this it probably wasn't a problem to have a small degree of error but in modern systems when we're running thousands and thousands of back tests or in a live trading system that's rule-based and algorithmic even a couple percent difference in this calculation of the indicator can make a huge difference i think it's best to demonstrate with an example here so let's look at these two individuals we have alice and we have bob and both alice and bob want to calculate the average true range the price data here is just some gold futures data that i found and alice starts calculating the average true range using the algorithm which i just explained on the 9th of december here so all she's doing is grabbing these previous 14 values dividing them by 14 that gives the initial value and then from then on you do 13 times the previous value plus the current value all divided by 14. okay simple enough nothing groundbreaking here you just carry on that calculation for each and every bar after this point using this value of the true range which is calculated with the formula i explained earlier now bob starts his calculation on the 19th of december here so just about 10 days later or 10 trading sessions bob starts calculating the average true range using the exact same formula and what we discover is that there's actually a discrepancy in the values here alice gets 36.21 and bob gets 35.47 this difference would be next to imperceptible on a hand-drawn graph or even if you're just eyeballing it using something like trading view but in a back test especially when you're doing lots and lots of them this small difference could be the difference between taking a trade and not taking a trade and then of course after that point your entire back test is going to be different depending on whether you took the trade or you didn't and with these rule-based trading systems we expect them to be deterministic given a certain set of data when in fact these are about two percent apart now thanks to the design of the algorithm over time these values get closer and closer together and so after a year of daily data they're so close that they're essentially imperceptible the differences between them we're approaching the limits of your standard floating point precision but for these first few bars especially maybe the first 10 or 20 even 50 bars there's a decently sized difference which is likely to lead to problems in your trading systems and it's not particular intuitive or at least it wasn't for me when i discovered this because when i think of an indicator having a length of say a 14 period i expect intuitively that it's only using data from the previous 14 days but as we'll see in the next section the average true range incorporates all previous data from the entire chart which means that even data from 30 40 50 bars ago is having some subtle impact on the final calculation which is then making these two separate calculations of the average true range differ even though they're using the exact same data set just starting at a different time if you want to understand mathematically why this happens 
I prepared a few slides here. So as we discussed, it's non-deterministic with regards to starting location. If I start calculating the average true range and you start 10 bars later, we're going to get subtly different results that converge over a long period of time, such that in 100 bars or 1000 bars, our results will be identical, but initially they're going to diverge. And if you don't account for this, you're going to have a bad time. So this is the formula here for the moving average of the true range. So zero represents the current value, one represents the previous value, etc. This is the formula that I just explained. So the current value of the moving average is one over the period multiplied by the period minus one times the previous average, all plus the average true range. It's just exactly the same as this taken from the book. Okay, and then we can do some algebra magic to this. And we eventually end up with this type of formula. So we can recursively define the current value of the average true range as being equal to one minus this a value, which is one over the period. So one over 14 in our case, multiplied by the previous value of the average true range plus a times the current value of the true range. Now we have this recursive formula. We can substitute that into itself a bunch of times. So you can take this formula for the average true range and substitute it in here. I think I just made a mistake there. That's supposed to be two, but it doesn't change the general idea. And basically what you'll see after doing this substitution over and over again is that we have this pattern. So the average true range is essentially each value of the true range that came before it multiplied by a weight until you get to that initial seed value, which we constructed from the average of the previous 14. So we have a weight value, which is this formula here. So KN, i.e. the weight value from the nth previous bar is equal to A times one minus A to the power N. And we continue this series all the way till we get back to that first point. There are two main takeaways from this formula and all that work we just did. The first one is that the importance of each value is decreasing exponentially. So this weight value here, this is getting smaller and smaller with each value of n because this one minus a is less than one. Therefore, we're raising it to a higher and higher power. It gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So that means that the true range from 100 bars ago is not going to have a huge amount of influence relative to the bar from two bars ago or three bars ago. That's one important takeaway from this. The other one is that all prior data is actually included as part of the average true range, not just the previous 14 or 21 or however long the period sets. It actually includes data from all of the true range values that you've used. So if we go back to the spreadsheet here and we look at say this value of the average true range, if we decompose that in a series format as the sum of weights of every single previous true range value, even though this value here is clearly more than 14 bars away, it does still have some small influence on the average true range much, much later on. And that's why these two values are different because they don't start at the exact same point. This series is taking into account this data and all of this data through here, and this one isn't. But the good thing is, at this point, they're now using the exact same points from this point onward. And these older points that were included are decreasing in relevancy at an exponential rate, so they become less and less important, and the error goes down over time. So if you're going to use the average true range or any kind of technical indicator with this Wilder's smoothing, be sure to account for this and leave a long warm up period, if at all possible, with your data set. If that isn't possible, you might want to consider using a different form of an average that will suit your purposes a little bit better. So, for example, we have the weighted moving average here. So it uses the price multiplied by the period, then the previous price multiplied by the period minus one, so on and so forth, divided by this at the bottom here. And because this is non-recursive, it will only use data from the previous n bars. And therefore, the calculation will be exactly the same no matter where in the data you start to calculate it. 
And charts like TradingView, for example, provide the weighted moving average and also the simple moving average. You can use the EMA, but that has very much the same kind of issues as the wilder smoothing has. And so if you can't get that extra 100 bars or so that you need, then it can be a good idea to use these other smoothing methods. The amount of warp data that you need will be related to the look back period that you choose. So if you choose, say, the 50 average true range, you're going to need a lot more warm up bars before you get, you know, these really small errors. So make sure to check that whenever you're doing your calculations for your particular look back period and making sure that these errors are sufficiently small for your use case.